Yeah, bye, please. Yeah, bye. <laughs> and in ten, nine, eight, seven. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a joint meeting of the City Council and School Committee. Uh, I have called as mayor in accordance with Northampton Charter, Section 7-2, Annual Budget Policy. Uh, I will first begin by asking the uh, Council Clerk
what we've been doing financially, uh, and then they give us a rating. And that rating is used as part of the bonding that we need to do to go out to borrow. So if you want to go to the next slide. One of the things, uh, well, first of all, I'm very happy to announce that after that rating call a couple of weeks ago, uh, Moody's did allow us to maintain our current rating. Uh, uh, but there were some, 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 some cautionary notes in there. Um, again, I'll start with the first one. Going forward, review of the city's credit strength will, rely, will heavily weigh its progress toward improving and maintaining balanced operations and replenishing reserves to levels equivalent to similar, similar uh, related rating communities. What could make the rating go down? A decline in reserves or liquidity position during fiscal year 2013 and failure to grow reserves consistent. And our financial advisor uh, at First Southwest uh, again, same story, looking at uh, looking at where we are in terms of our unassigned fund balance at the end of 2012, which is about 5.2% of our budget. Uh, she pointed out that most communities that have the similar bond rating uh, that we have are somewhere in the range of 10% in terms of what they're showing in their unassigned fund balance. Let's go to the next slide. So, this is the Moody's on the left and Standard & Poor's on the right. You'll see that we are at AA2 with Moody's. We just retained that rate, and we're at A-plus with Standard & Poor's. Just by way of comparison, I asked our bond rating agency that when we borrowed money recently for the police station, what would have been the impact had we been downgraded to AA3? And she ran the numbers in terms of and the debt curves and all the other things, and she estimated it would be close to half, we would have paid close to half a million more in interest uh, because that rating translates into the type of interest rates that we're able to secure. So the bond rating and the reserve position is very important. Go ahead. So this is a look at, over the last 10 years, what our, what our reserve position has been. And our reserves are made up of our free cash, that's in green, uh, the, the general fund stabilization fund, and then the capital stabilization fund. Uh, these are all the various components that go into our reserves. And you can see how we, we were doing a great job in the early 2000s building up those reserves. You can also see when the economy uh, took a turn for the worse, uh, 2008 to 2009. Look at 2010, you can see we had a negative uh, free cash balance at the end of that year. Uh, that, was, that was a revenue deficit. Uh, many other communities were in the same boat. That was the year that we, basically the state cut our aid mid-year um, and cut $2 million from our state aid. So we've worked really hard in the last couple of years, and particularly one of the things we focused on in FY13 was trying to rebuild those reserves. So you can see that we've made some progress to get them back up again. Uh, and again, it's, it's not only about the bond rating, it's also about having the ability to deal with emergencies that come up, uh, you know, unknown, un unforeseen expenditures uh, that you need to be able to have those reserves uh, to tap into. Next slide. So now let's take a look at how we're comparing with other communities. And again, we'll start with the reserve position. So this is a, a sampling of similar sized and similar budget sized communities from across the state. Um, so you'll see just quickly Northampton, Tewksbury, North Attleboro, Milton, Andover, Stoughton, Belmont, Gloucester, Reading, Dedham, Danvers, and West Springfield. Northampton's over here on the right, and you can see uh, how our reserve position, these were FY12 numbers because those were the only ones that are available to the DOR right now because FY13 hasn't closed out. But you can see where Northampton rates uh, compared to comparable communities. We'll pull it in a little bit more local. Um, and these are neighboring communities. So this is Northampton, East Hampton, Ludlow, Greenfield, East Longmeadow, Longmeadow, Amherst, and West Springfield. Again, most of the other towns, uh, with the exception of West Springfield, are smaller towns than Northampton you can see where we are in terms of our reserve position, actually slightly less than even East Hampton in terms of our reserve uh, position. Go to the next slide. These are some of the other metrics from those same neighboring communities. This is our single family average value on our home. You see we do quite well in terms of our property value there. The state average is 357,996. We're at 297,323. This is the average single family tax bill. For this current fiscal year, 2013, the state average is 4,926. You can see we're sort of right in the middle of the pack there at 4,240. And then you can see how everyone else, obviously Amherst and Longmeadow at the upper end of the, of the spectrum. These are residential tax rates. So this is the per thousand tax rate of these same communities. 
uh, again in the current fiscal year. Our new tax rate, which was uh, just, just went to $14.26, you see how that compares with other uh, neighboring communities uh, in the area, all the way up to Long Meadow, which is $21.54 uh, per thousand. So now let's take a look at the revenue, uh, what the revenue trends have been. Um, that graphic had an upward trend. I wish that were the case in the actual slideshow, but this is the um, this is the pie as it looks for FY 2013. These are all the various sources of revenue uh, that we rely on to put the budget together. Obviously, taxes 61.5 percent being the largest share. That's property taxes. That's real estate, excise, meals taxes, um, state aid. That's an important number, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. Again, that's Chapter 70, that's uh, unrestricted uh, general government aid. Uh, charges for services, uh, that's everything from uh, tuition that's charged for some of students to other uh, services that we provide. Uh, that could be uh, buying a ticket in the parking garage or parking meter, et cetera. If you go to the next slide, you'll kind of see it broken out um, into those various parts with some of the component pieces underneath it. Um, Again, uh, you see the various breakdowns, uh, and we'll go through some of those revenue sources and take a look at how the trends have been over time. So this is our property tax revenue trend. This is, again, taking a look at the 10-year the ten year, uh, well, ten year look at that. We've, we've kind of broken it out. Residential, obviously, is the largest in the blue. Uh, red is the commercial. Green is the industrial. And, and that smaller slice of purple is the personal property tax. You can sort of see it's followed a, a fairly uh, uh, steady trend. That's obviously a result of Proposition Two and a Half, you know, where we're at, able to uh, raise it two and a half percent, add in new growth, and, and calculate forward from there. 2010, there was a slight uptick. That was the two million dollar general override that the voters adopted. That allowed us to move up uh, and 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 give us a little bit more room in terms of uh, in terms of our overall levy. This is new growth. New growth is that number that after you calculate the proposition two and a half increase, you're allowed to then add new growth. That's any new uh, buildings, any new housing. Uh, and so you can sort of see how new growth has gone over time. Again, looking at 2009, 2010, where there was a slump. We had a really good year in 2012. That was largely uh, Cole Morgan's new facility uh, coming onto the tax rolls as well as some new housing. Uh, we have, uh, we went down slightly in 2013. We are projecting an increase for next year of about, or we're projecting about 600,000 in new growth. Again, I think largely attributable to all the development that's happening on King Street as well as at Village Hill. So that's a positive sign because again, that's one of the other ways that we're allowed to grow that levy. This is uncollected taxes. Uh, again, this has never been a major problem, I think, for Northampton. Our, our collector's office, uh, working with our treasurer's office, has been very diligent in terms of making sure that, uh, that uh, these numbers stay low. Um, and so not, not any real uh, surprises there. Motor vehicle excise, you know, not a large amount of revenue, but again, it's, it's just useful to see sort of the cyclical nature of how that revenue source, like many of our re revenue sources, can sort of depend on you know, years that people are buying new cars or, or, uh, or people are holding onto their cars longer. Uh, go to the next slide. This is a, a, a newer, newer revenue for us. Um, you've got the hotel, motel, and meals taxes. Um, the, uh, the hotel motel tax existed um, back to 2003. When we got to 2010, the state passed uh, a local option that we could add additional, uh, we could add to both the hotel motel as well as add a meals tax um, on top of our sales tax, which we availed ourselves of. And you can see that those have helped us increase revenue uh, and have remained fairly steady. Uh, the 2013 number, there's an asterisk because we still, that's, that's a projection, and it's uh, it, that we, we suspect it's going to finish at, at or slightly above where we were in 2012. So that's been a fairly uh, strong source of revenue, uh, which I think is important because it also speaks to the fact that the uh, that our downtown has remained fairly healthy, our restaurant and our hotel industry. And I also note that we have one hotel that's uh, going to be going into construction, a new hotel going into construction next year, which will both add to the tax base as well as increase these hotel motel taxes. So the next slide 
uh, is probably one of the most important uh, slides that we'll talk about tonight. This is our net state aid, uh, and again, taking a look from 2002 to 2013. Uh, and you can sort of see the, the kind of the roller coaster ride that we've been on. Um, again, climb, you know, at, at, a, at a high of about 13.5 million back in 2002, then the sharp decline, and then we've made it back up to about 12.1 uh, million uh, in FY 2008, and then you can see sort of the steady decline uh, ever since uh, in, in terms of state aid. Again, that's education, that's also just general aid on the city side. So taking that 2008 number, which is when we started the latest slide, uh, this shows you kind of the decline since 2008. If, if the state had just level funded us at the 2008 level over these last five years, that would have been $10.3 million in additional revenue that the city would have realized if they had just level funded us uh, during those years. So I just want to keep, I know I'm sort of becoming a broken record, but I just want to emphasize how important these revenue sources and the loss of revenue sources have, have been in terms of affecting our ability to, to, to build a balanced budget and maintain services. This is state aid. Uh, this is Chapter 70 education aid. Uh, these, uh, the blue is, this, is the Chapter 70 that comes to us for the Northampton Public Schools. The green is for Smith Vocational. Again, very static. Uh, hasn't been a lot of uh, increases. Um, you know, this has been one of the, uh, like, like local aid, uh, where, um, you know, you can see a slight decline in 2008, but then it's been fairly flat over those times, while at the same time, the costs of providing <coughs> that education has, has continued to increase upward. This is the unrestricted general government aid. Uh, this is, again, this is the local aid that comes to the, to the city side of the budget. Um, it used to be broken out into lottery and additional assistance, the blue and red. Uh, then it all got folded into one category, which we call unrestricted general government aid. And interestingly, they folded it all together, and, and it's actually less. Uh, it turned out to be less uh, in FY 2010. Uh, so again, you can see how that's been fairly level, flat, going down um, over, over the last several years. This is uh, charges for services. Uh, this is actually two of our, of our cost centers, our parking uh, fund, as well as the ambulance service. And this, uh, this is illustrated to show you how we've, over time, been shifting more and more of those parking revenues and those ambulance revenues over to the general uh, budget to help us balance the budget. So in the case of the parking meter receipts, we've been more and more using that to supplement police officers hiring police officers who patrol downtown, paying for police vehicles, uh, paying for all of the, uh, all the maintenance and staff in the, in the parking uh, maintenance division, the PPOs, all of that. On the ambulance side, we've used that ambulance revenue to pay for buying new ambulances, for paying uh, for EMT uh, salaries and stipends, um, and again, capital expenditures on the ambulance side. So it's been a revenue source, but increasingly, uh, we've had to uh, uh, use more and more of it to, to able to, uh, to pay for general services. These are the interfund operating transfers, or the indirect charges. Uh, these are from our three, our three enterprise funds. Uh, sewer is red, water is blue, solid waste is yellow. So the enterprise, are, the enterprise funds are separate standalone budgets that perform those tasks, but they do pay back to the general fund a certain amount of money each year to cover the expenses that we provide, the services that we provide to those funds. So for example, the collector's office sends out all the bills, does all the billing, does all of the collections for the water and sewer. So there's a charge back to that. Our, our finance department, our auditing department, legal, all of those uh, things uh, incur, incur charges back. Um, so you can sort of see how that has uh, changed and evolved over time. Obviously the biggest change is that yellow one, which is the solid waste. And you can see, as we've now made the decision to close the landfill, those, uh, those indirect charges back to the city have now gone down, gone down, gone down. And in, and in FY 2014, they'll be gone. Uh, and uh, again, you can see sort of the shift between water and sewer. But these are important, uh, it's been an important revenue source for us on the general side, as well as obviously paying for providing those important infrastructure for the city. 
These are just uh, parking tickets and RMV fines. Again, uh, another revenue source. The parking tickets obviously are self-explanatory. The RMV fines are any other tickets that get issued in Northampton. Uh, you know, not not uh, not any discernible trends here. There was a, a slight downturn. Uh, we're following the same downturn in other revenues. Uh, it has gone up a little bit, um, but again, this is one of the other revenue sources that we rely on to be able to provide uh, the services in the general fund. These are licenses and permits. Again, another one of those revenues, not a very big revenue source, but definitely very cyclical um, and, and tied to the economy. So this is everything from the permits to the building inspector issues, plumbing inspector, wire inspector, weights and measures. And you can kind of see how those have been uh, fairly you know, up and down, up and down uh, over time. Uh, and again, uh, tied to the economy and, and particularly to the housing this is investment in income. Again, this is the this uh, you know our our uh, the funds that we have in bank accounts uh, to to run the city. This is the investment income that we earn on that. I'm sure this doesn't look much different than your uh, savings or CD statements that you have at home. You can see in 2006, 2007, uh, you know the, the numbers that we were earning in those years. Uh, you know upwards of six hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, now in 2013, about 123,000. So that's a drop again of, of, of revenue, just in investment income uh, in bank. These are some federal revenues. We don't get a lot of federal aid, uh, fairly, but this is Medicaid, Medicare, and CPG and directs. Again, not a lot that we get from the federal government anymore, but you can again see the same kind of downward trend uh, over the last several years. So now we'll just move over to the expense side of the budget. These are the uh, expense trends, and we'll go ahead and start with that same pie chart that I showed you before. Um, this is basically how we spend our money, and it's broken down into the various uh, categories. We show here education as the largest at 38%, um, employee benefits, that's healthcare, insurance, retirement, um, at 20%, and then we move over to public safety, debt service, general government, um, one of the things about this chart, uh, obviously education is, is the largest expenditure, but then you also have to factor in that a, a portion of other parts of the budget also go toward education. So employee benefits, um, the debt service, uh, as well as those charges, state assessment charges that we'll talk about, which are for charter school and for school choice. And this is actually a chart that, that kind of depicts that. Um, so if you factor in the debt service on school projects, if you factor in the employee benefits that the city pays on school um, on school employees like healthcare, um, if you factor in the state assessments for a charter and for school choice, um, uh, then it actually brings that number up to 58% of the budget is devoted to education um, in the city. Then you can sort of see how the others uh, how the others play out when we, when we shift it that way. This is again that same uh, that same overview of the of the various parts of the budget. You know, obviously, public works is our DPW. Um, you know, culture and recreation, which is two percent, includes the libraries, it includes the rec department, it includes first night and the arts council. Human services is the board of health, the vets, and the council on aging. And you can kind of see the various uh, different uh, services that we provide under each one of those budget categories. This is an interesting uh, chart. We looked at the 10-year average percentage increases over that 10-year span, uh, 2004 uh, to 2013. And these were kind of the, the top three um, areas that went up the most over that 10-year period. Now, I know the human services one is, sort of stands out at 12.81%, but that's largely the veterans' benefits. We've seen that spike in veterans' benefits over the last 10 years. The city. Um, provides veteran benefits to, to any eligible veterans in the city, the state reimburses us at 75%, but we don't get it to the next fiscal year, so we have to budget for that uh, for those um, for those benefits every year. So that's been a major area. State assessments, which we'll look at a chart for later, I think the, the big the big uh, rise there has been charter school uh, tuition and the and the school choice uh, uh, sending tuitions. And then employee benefits, uh, which again Healthcare, retirement, et cetera. So those have been sort of the three largest increases in spending 
um, that have happened over those uh, over those several years. And I would say, just to point out, that you know, the top, the, at least the well, two of them, and you make an argument one way or the other for the three, are largely beyond our control. Um, they're not things that we have an ability to control. Obviously, we want to provide as much veterans benefits as we can for the veterans in our city. Uh, the other one, the, the charter at school choice, obviously, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a number we look at and we obviously try to work on uh, school choice and trying to attract and keep kids in our district and obviously the healthcare one. Uh, larger forces at work in the healthcare economy, but we've also tried to take steps to minimize that as well. So this is the education appropriation. So this is just stripping away all the, you know, the, the choice, the charter, the debt, all of the other parts that go into education funding and just purely looking at the education appropriation from the general fund. Blue for school department, green uh, for Smith Boat. Again, level, fairly level, not very you know, major increases over time, which again reflects the general overall stress in the city budget um, that you see across all departments. This is employee benefits. This is our retirement assessment. The city each year uh, receives an assessment for what it needs to pay into the retirement system to keep that system solvent for our, our for our retired employees, and each year that's been uh, that's been growing. Uh, so uh, so that's another one of those uh, ones that we'll look at, and there'll be an increase this year as well. This is health insurance expenditures for the city. Uh, this is again taking that ten-year view at, at what we're paying uh, to provide health insurance for our employees. You can see uh, back in FY 2003 we were down just under six million dollars, and then you can sort of follow the the, the rise over to FY 2013, uh, where we are now paying $10,400,000 uh, for those benefits. Again, that's a major a major change, and it's, uh, and it's one of the big cost drivers in our budget. It's also one of the reasons why I asked the City Council uh, last November to uh, give me and the City the authority under the new health insurance reform law to be able to make uh, plan design changes outside of collective bargaining to a new process that the state has developed. And the city council did vote to give me that authority. And that's going to be one of the things we're going to be looking at to try to see if there are ways that we can find savings in health insurance. Because again, it's one of our biggest uh, budget drivers. This is uh, showing police and fire, our public safety expenditures. You can kind of see how uh, blue is police, red is fire. Uh, fairly intuitive, I hope, and, um, and uh, you can sort of see how those have changed over time. Uh, you can see how fire has kind of uh, sort of caught up with uh, police largely uh, because of the ambulance and moving to a full-time EMS service. Um, so you can see how public safety, although in the last three years, obviously, that's been flat. We, we've uh, had to level fund essentially those, uh, those three budget areas, those three budget years. This is debt. So this is uh, this is basically our debt service. What we're paying to service the debt that we borrowed to pay for all the various projects uh, that we have. The little teeny tiny ones, capital leases. That's for you know, small things where we may you know, buy uh, buy equipment on a five-year lease. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, long-term. Uh, let's see the the temporary bonds, uh, principal and pay down. Those we do short-term. Uh, borrowings from time to time until we build up enough uh, that we want to do a, a full long-term borrowing. So that reflects that in the green. Uh, the red is the interest on our long-term bonds, and then the uh, the dark is the long-term bond principal. Again, you can sort of see um, how that uh, has has uh, changed over time. We've had to we've actually made more investments in recent years in our capital infrastructure, trying to trying to renew our fleet of trucks and vehicles, and uh, as well as working on major capital projects like the senior center, the police station, uh, our school building uh, projects, etc. <coughs> so this is a look at future projected debt. So that's starting at 2013, and we and looking at projections for how that debt's going to play out over the next 10 years with the projects that are in the pipeline, as well as ones that we put that, that have been put in the pipeline. Uh, in the past. For example, the DPW uh, facility, uh, which was put in uh, the pipeline by the previous administration, there's an $8.5 million uh, projection there that was put in the budget uh, that, would be, that would, was projected to be bonded in 2016. That's in there. So you, 
the most important numbers to look at on this chart, I mean, the, the top three, the yellow, the red, and the green, are really sort of outside sources that pay for the debt. They, it's either uh, an outside source or the CPA or the CDPG funds the debt, or MSBA reimbursements, which are really just the states paying back for a, for a share of the borrowing. The ones that are important to the general fund budget, well, the blue is the debt excluded debt. So those are the ones where we've done debt exclusion overrides. But the, the most, so probably the most important one is the program. That's what we have to come up with from the general fund budget to pay for the debt service on that particular year. So again, you can see how that's a number that as we try to make investments in our infrastructure, in our buildings, uh, we have to borrow and we have to be able to service that debt. So you know, every time that we incur another 100000 or 200000 in debt service, that's less than we have available in the general budget to put towards other services. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's, it's it's sort of a pay now or pay later. We can, we can only defer maintenance on buildings. We can only defer buying vehicles for so long. Uh, and, and then it becomes more costly if we don't make those investments. So this is, again, the state assessments that I talked about. This is school choice and charter school. It's important to note that the, these, the way these function, uh, they're not part of the school budget. They actually come out of the general fund budget. So the state takes them out of the general fund budget. Um, they're not deducted from, from school aid or from the school budget. So you can see, again, the climb. Blue is charter school sending tuition, the money that we send out uh, to other schools when a, when a North Hampton student goes to a charter school. And then the red is school choice, when someone choices in to another uh, district for North Hampton. Again, you can see uh, the rise in that over time. Um, and it's, again, I start from where we were in FY 2003, where it was about you know, 800,000 a year. It's now climbed to over 2.5 million a year that we're sending um, out, of, out of our city uh, to pay for those tuitions. FY 2014. That's a uh, revenue, uh, a projection that's off the, the cherry sheet that the governor issued with his budget. You can see the trend continues. So, what does all this mean for um, FY 2014? And my office is cute and got this little crystal ball. And it's not me in the suit, but uh, they thought that was fun. So, so what does all this mean when we take a look at where where we've come in the FY 2015 budget? What our revenues are looking like, uh, what our what our expenditures are looking like. So we'll take a, a quick look through that. So this is the um, these are the estimated revenue changes that we're fairly confident we know we have to deal with in FY 2014. These are revenues that we think we'll be able to uh, to get in, in the upcoming uh, fiscal year. Obviously, the Prop two and a half increase. Uh, is is fairly set. That's that's the 1.94, uh, 1.094 million new growth that I mentioned before, 600,000. And then you kind of go down through the other various revenue sources that we're fairly certain we can count on. The one that I have to put a big asterisk on is under state aid, and that's uh, you see I've noted that that's based on the governor's budget proposal. So last week the governor uh, on the on the 23rd. Uh, released House 1, which was his budget uh, that he presents to the legislature. Um, obviously, it's a very ambitious budget. He's really called for some very bold uh, revenue measures. He's calling for very bold investments in transportation, uh, as well as in um, education, particularly in early childhood uh, and secondary education, and, and really trying to, to, to start a conversation about revenue that our legislature has frankly been trying to dodge for the last several years. And I think he's really now trying to put this out there. And so far, the reception has been has been good. There hasn't, uh, it hasn't been dead on arrival. I think that my sense from the House and the Senate and talking to folks there, that they they do recognize the need to look at new revenues. But whether, what his budget will look like by the time the House issues their budget, we're not sure. But we've plugged in for now uh, the, the, the new aid that we forecast as part of the governor's uh, budget, which again, in chapter 70, in the governor's budget, we would see a $71,000 increase in chapter 70. So not a major increase in funds. On the general government side, we'd see about $134,000 uh, in, in, uh, in new aid. Again, 
not even one, not even really a one percent increase from last year. So, so we've tried to build all that in, and so our estimated new revenue is one point three nine five nine one two, or one point four million. So that's what we expect. Uh, we will be able to, to grow a new revenue above what we had in FY uh, thirteen. So that's the revenue side. We'll go to the uh, to the expense side. And again, these are no expense changes uh, that we know. In most cases, we, we know we have to uh, incorporate into the budget. So that retirement assessment that I talked about, where we have to make a contribution to the retirement fund, that's going up 240,000. So we know we have to increase that. There are several things that overlay exemptions and overlay deficits. Those are required. Uh, the assessors have to build those into uh, their offices uh, when, when they're doing the tax uh, program because they have to do, have them available by law to be able to cover exemptions that people may file for in a given fiscal year. Again, you see that charter school sending tuition number. That's going up 295435 again, on the general uh, side. Um, you can go down the line and see where we've tried to build in uh, increases for workers' comp, uh, uh, we've tried to build in modest investments in those reserve funds I talked about, our debt service, um, which actually is going down slightly, uh, our, our, um, our uh, debt excluded debt actually goes down each year, um, so we're actually seeing a little bit of uh, a decrease in that category. Uh, we've got a legal settlement with the firefighters, that's a, a $45,000 charge that, that is pending at this point. And then we've got all the collective uh, bargaining agreements that we reached in FY13 on the city side that we used tailings from the FY12 budget to pay for. We know we have to incorporate those into next year's budget. And then on the health insurance side, I'm putting in a projection here of 10% of on the increase. Um, and, and that's sort of a marker at this point. I, I, frankly, I'm concerned that it could be higher than that, and we can talk about that in the next slide. Last year, we started with about a 12 or 12.8 percent quote on our insurance. Uh, that did come down to about 8 percent by the end of it. But when we met with our insurance, we have a consultant that we use that, that helps us in this health insurance uh, market. They look at our utilization rates. They look at how much insurance our employees utilize. Um, and we're, so the benchmark usually in the insurance industry is about 80 to 85 percent. 85 to 90 percent. And in fact, you may know the new state law says that if your insurance company um, doesn't spend or spends less than the 85 percent, you get a rebate check. Uh, and so, or, and so, some people have been getting checks, uh, rebate checks. Uh, but, but really, where we are in terms of our utilization is in the 97 to 98 percent in terms of employee utilization. So we know that the the insurance company, by keeping our rates down, have been sort of taking the loss in their, in their administrative overhead and, and other uh, profit centers in order to allow us to stay where we are. So we know that that's going to come up again. We're still waiting. They, they, um, the rate quotes have not yet come in from the, various, uh, from the various providers. And the other factor that we're waiting for is the GIC. The GIC rates have not yet been set. And again, that's something under this new health care reform that we that we now have the authority to work under, the GIC becomes a benchmark for the conversations that you have about health insurance. Uh, so we really need that number as well. So that's going to be the one that we're going to be working on in the next several weeks uh, with our consultant and, and ultimately meeting with our employees about to see if we can either keep that, arrive at a lower number than that 10% increase. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, keep those costs under control. But for now, we're using that 10%. So 1.95 uh, million, again, are the known expense changes. So again, turn, turn to the next slide, and you can see the, the, what we're estimating for revenue, what we, what we know are some of our expenses at this point. Currently, that shows a gap um, of $560,000. Again, this is very preliminary because we still have a lot of unknown. There's that health insurance number that could exceed 10%. Um, the other thing that we have to factor in is that all of our uh, bargaining units, both on the school side and the city side, uh, will have open contracts in, in, in FY14. So 
Um, there, though there are increases there that have to be factored in, steps and colon increases, and any other um, any other uh, expenditures that may be um, warranted because of a collective bargaining agreement. We also have some grants that are expiring, which we're still waiting to find out about in terms of what those may have impact on. We're also in the Joint Labor Management uh, Committee, the JLMC, with the Firefighters Union. The firefighters have not had a contract for three years, so we're now in a formal state process. So we, we and that process is going on, and we're not sure what the decision will be, but we have to be able to fund that decision. Uh, uh, and then the final one is departmental budget needs. We're going to be obviously meeting with all of our departments, obviously the school department, and all of our city departments to look at what their individual budget needs are, and there may be unique needs in each department that may also warrant additional uh, additional expenditures. But for now, that's sort of the working uh, gap that we have. So what are the next steps? So again, in, in February, I'm going to begin meeting with all of uh, the departments. Uh, we'll be uh, sending out budget worksheets to them, and we'll be sitting down with them to really go through their Obviously, there are 13 budgets with an eye towards building their budgets uh, for 14. Um, in March, I'm going to be again doing a series of the town hall budget meetings around the city. Uh, I've already uh, I've plugged in uh, I think five of them here, one, two, three, four, five of them. And we'll be putting out that schedule again to get out into the community to talk about some of these issues and try to get feedback from the community as I try to put together uh, my budget. Under the new charter, uh, there's sort of a different chronology now. So April 17, uh, 2013, uh, we're hoping that the two school budgets, the Northampton Public Schools and, and the Smith School, will have adopted their budget so that they could be submitted to the mayor. Um, and then I am required by charter to submit, uh, to submit my budget to the city council. And the date that we've identified for that is May 16, uh, 2013. So there's a lot of time that's going to pass here, and there's a lot of these numbers uh, that are really preliminary at this point uh, that will start to shape up. And, and as we go through these conversations with departments, as I go out to the public and talk with them, um, we'll be trying to share that information as we know it. Obviously, the health care one is going to be a big uh, number. And then the other big number we'll be looking at very carefully is that toward the end of March, the House will be finally releasing its budget, probably about the first week in April. The House of Representatives will release its budget. And I think that's really, we've typically, uh, the House budget has typically been the, sort of the benchmark for what ultimately happens. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the House does with the, with the governor's uh, you know, very bold proposals uh, for revenue um, and, and really looking at what they're doing. Particularly, we'll be watching, obviously, in Chapter 78 and in local aid, um, what, those, what those numbers work out to be. Slide. Actually, I think that's the last slide. So, if you want to <clears throat> shut that down. So that concludes my sort of overall presentation. Again, I, what I've tried to do is go through you know, what we've done in FY 2013, try to talk about that 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 issue um, of our reserve position and why it's so important. And again, the, the, the difficulty of the reserve position is you've got, you've got the general budget here, and you're trying to make decisions about what you want to fund in the here and now, but you have to also have discipline to try to make sure you're, you're keeping some amount of savings in your, in your savings account. Um, and, and again, it has, in, it has greater impacts than just on your local budget, because then when you go out tomorrow, your bond rating can be affected by that. And again, I hearken back to that uh, to the bond report. We will be issuing a, a copy of that uh, latest bond rating. And again, the concern is uh, they were, I think, Likely, we might have been downgraded this time, but I think they were impressed with the work that we had done very aggressively in the FY 2013 budget to really build up our reserves, as well as I think they were very impressed with our strong values in Northampton, the valuations of our property, and all the economic development that's going on, uh, particularly in the King Street and Village Hill area. Um, so those are some of the major issues. Um, and then I guess I would open up the floor for any questions or discussion. Um, this meeting is sort of intended to kind of launch the formal budget process uh, and sort of set the stage for that. So any comments or questions that people have? Mr. Bourne. Um, do you have any idea where uh, health insurance uh, utilization rates are so high? 
Is that anything we can? I think it's a combination of, uh, I think the, I, frankly, I think we've, well, we've been very creative and worked very hard and worked with our employees to try to keep, uh, to, to try to tinker with things like co-pays and tinker with trying to make sure people utilize generics. And, and frankly, also our, our provider has really wanted to keep us as a client, uh, Health New England. And I appreciate that. And so they've, in some cases, I think, given us rates that probably are discounted. Um, and then I, and, and so I think the result is you see that we're, we're, you know, we're utilizing a lot more because probably we should be paying a lot more uh, based on the size of our city. We, we do dig down and drill down into the numbers and they take a look, they, we walk through with our consultant, they look at claims, they look at drug utilization, they look at some of our you know, folks who have really uh, serious illnesses. Um, there's not really any one factor, uh, again, I just think that it's, it's, a, it's a fact of, you know, the fact that we, we kept those rates suppressed in some sense, um, and now I think we're kind of butting up against that in the last couple of years. So, Councilor. Yes, um, Mayor, how many other cities are right now connected with GIC? You know? um, hmm, I wish I had that chart with me. Uh, there are several cities, uh, several cities around, well, Example in our local area, uh, Pittsfield, Springfield, um, or at the GIC. Obviously, UMass is in the GIC because they're in the state. A lot of eastern Massachusetts communities um, are in the GIC, uh, and so it is something that we'll look at. Uh, but more importantly, the G this is the Group Insurance Commission. This is the state's health care plan. They go out every year and purchase health care for their employees, and they it's basically a, a cafeteria plan get to choose from several different, and in fact, Health New England uh, is one of them, same provider that we use. Um, and you get, and they negotiate the rates with all these insurance providers. Um, and so uh, they kind of use the economy of scale of all their employees in the state to be able to negotiate better rates. Um, so that is something that we'll look at, but more importantly, we'll be looking at what the GIC rates are, because th those now become the benchmark that we can use in this new process, if we can show that we can offer a plan uh, that is comparable or better to the GIC and can generate savings, we're allowed greater latitude in terms of moving into that plan. Um, that's kind of how the new health reform law works. There's a process that we go through. There's an employee committee um, that we meet with to talk about those changes. But if we can meet certain benchmarks and we can show certain savings and share some of the savings with employees in the first year, then we're allowed to so that's something we're going to be taking a really close look at. It, it was, a, it was a, a, an interesting year because this was the year that the GIC went out to bid on all of its plans. It doesn't do that every year. It does it like every three years. Um, and then they have a meeting coming up at the end of February. Uh, well, in, in February, we hope to actually set the rates for the year. So that's when you'll see uh, what the rates will be. We've actually missed the deadline to go into it um, uh, that's the other oddity about the GIC is that you have to notify them uh, by December 1st to move into it. This year we would have been flying triple blind because A, we don't know what the rates are, B, we don't even know who the providers are, um, and, and we don't even know what our, what our plan is going to come in at. So uh, it wasn't really prudent to, to look at it or think about even moving into it, um, but we are going to take a look at those numbers very carefully um, over the next couple of months and see if we can come up with some savings. In, uh, 10 cities, 26 towns, 8 school districts, and 4 charters. Yeah, a number of my colleagues in the eastern part of the state, Salem, uh, uh, is one that I know um, moved into it recently. Um, and uh, so it's, it's been more of an eastern mass. I mean, I think we've done a really good job of containing costs. Um, and uh, so in eastern plans, eastern hospitals tend to be way more expensive. Um, but again, as, as we start to feel the pressure, it's something we have to take a look at. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to thank you for the, the presentation. It, um, it's like, almost like a broken record. It seems to be year after year after year. Any uh, increase in the levy that we have or uh, new growth is always consumed by health insurance and retirement. It's almost to the penny. So when anything else that comes in that up is a bigger debt, it's a bigger hole. 
And I think that's I think that's important because I, I know that, and again, I, I worked very hard, um, and I know the superintendent has on the school side, really looking at spending, trying to look at um, how we can build efficiencies, how we can try to, in some cases, merge departments. Um, but at the end of the day, the, one of the biggest problems we have is not the spending, it's the revenue. It's the, and you can see that graphic we showed where over the last five years, we've lost $10 million. You know, if we had just been level funded, that's revenue that we could have had to pay for those health insurance increases, to pay for those charter school assessments, uh, to pay for you know, adding services that we need to add. So um, I keep stressing it's a, it's a revenue, it really is a revenue issue. Um, and I you know, obviously look to Beacon Hill uh, because that's where we've seen uh, uh, the largest drop off in terms of our budget. Uh, we're at 20% of our budget now, it used to be 30% of our budget not too long ago. So that's, a, that's an important, we're limited to what we can do at the local level. We've you know, we obviously uh, you know, tax to the full two and a half percent levy. We've done an override. Uh, we adopted the full meals tax. We've adopted the full hotel motel tax. We've adopted the CBA to try to help. And I think Northampton has really uh, availed itself of everything we can do at the local level. Um, and now I think we're, we're seeing, uh, we're, we need to be hopeful that the leadership in Boston steps to try to increase revenue uh, for the state, but also, also for cities and towns. Uh, the superintendent and then Mr. Moore. Uh, first, I want to say thank you uh, for this presentation tonight. I want to compliment both you and Susan Wright for putting together this presentation. Uh, it's my second time through it, and I have to say it's one of the finest presentations of uh, any place that I've worked. Uh, detailed, comprehensive, and yet you explain it in a way that's very easy to understand and to follow how we get to where we get to. So thank you very much for the time that you both put into this. Thank you. As we're sitting here taking notes and uh, getting to work tomorrow morning on building our school budget, uh, you know, last year we were level funded and we were able to give us about 200000 more to build our school budget. But as I'm looking at this this year, and I know you'll give us more specific directions soon, uh, to me, it doesn't look like it's even a, a chance of level funded for the school department for next year. And, uh, yeah, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Susan and I were actually, and again, I do want to thank Susan, and I want to thank Lynn Simmons in my office, and, and everyone on my staff who's helped work to, who's been a scramble even up to the last hour or so to finalize this presentation. Um, and we have been talking about that. I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think you're right. I think level funding is, uh, you know, maybe optimistic at this point. Um, but I do think that we're going to try to be very aggressive in terms of trying to find those savings in health care. I also think, you know, I think we're going to have to, um, you know, on the, on the city side and the school committee on the, on the school side, in collective bargaining, I think we really have to try to tell this story to our employees. Um, and I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to meet with employees. I'm to talk to school employees about it and really try to tell the story that we're facing right now um, in terms of those negotiations because those are still the, those are some of the biggest unknowns in terms of what will impact that gap. Mm -hmm. um, so that so yes, I think that's an accurate appraisal. Um, I think we're I think we probably will start though with building a level funded budget to see what that looks like. That we may have to then build in contingencies, you know, maybe on a larger basis for things like the, the um, collective bargaining agreements uh, that we can try to uh, cover as we go forward. We'll see. That's, but I think you're, I think you're right. We haven't released the budget sheets yet. We'll be doing that next week. We're going to be talking about it some more. Uh, but I think that that's, you know, again, I think we're looking at once again trying to provide the same level of services without the uh, commensurate increase in. Funding to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Moore. Um, is, the, is the city free cash amount, does that include any um, reserves in the school budget? Uh, no. Uh, no, that's, we don't, that doesn't get calculated towards that. So, so like the, like the um, choice, uh, what's the what called? The, um, circuit break. Circuit break. Those we have as reserves. Yeah. No, we're not counting those reserves. And I'm also, it's also important to note that we're not also we're not focusing on the um, reserves that the water enterprise fund or the sewer enterprise fund or 
Because we can't access those. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. It, it would be helpful if, it, if, it, if those numbers could be in there. Yeah. Um, well, the problem is that, you know, it, it, it may not be helpful because if I put the water enterprise reserve fund in there, we can't use the water. By law, we can't touch the water reserve enterprise fund for anything but the water system. So, uh, but, but certainly reserves on the school side, right, that's what's um, which I'm not sure where those stand at this point. But it would just seem like it would be a way to make the number bigger without having more money. Uh, well, it, unfortunately, what, yeah. we, what we end up doing is we give all of our financials to them. They go through it. They, they're the ones who set the, the well, benchmark. Is it's a city reserve. It's one of the yeah. Of the city. And the, in other words, the other departments don't. In other words, their free cash, DPW's free cash, isn't DPW's free cash. It's the city's free You're correct. Yeah. And so, and, and so that's what I'm saying about the school's free cash, which is that we're not getting credit for it in terms of our bond ratings. Yeah, but even we, though it seems to me to be analogous to it. Yeah, I think it's probably, I think they, I think it's looked at, but I, again, it's not something that, that's the school departments and the school committees, doesn't, the city council can't appropriate the aid for those funds, and maybe Susan can add to that. School choice is restricted, mm -hmm. so it can't be considered free cash. Schools don't, you don't have any free cash. You have reserves, you have school choice, you have circuit breaker, wherever those, you know, whatever balances those have. But circuit breaker is restricted special ed costs and school choices only can, can, can only be spent by appropriation of the school committee. So that's why those can't get figured in. Free cash actually has to be what the city has that's basically not spoken for in some other way. So it's very, very analogous to the enterprise budget. Yeah. Um, 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 Mr. Meyer and then just Mr. Ward said college. Since we mentioned the water system, I'm just wondering about Tens of millions of dollars that may be needed to upgrade storm sewers and outfalls under the yep. EPA regulations, as well as the article today about 14.7 million for the dams. Yes. And I wonder if they just keep coming. Yes. yes. Even though, and even though those are outside yeah, the city's bonding, um, but they still put pressure on residents in the city. Those are still amounts that are paid by taxpayers. And so if taxpayers are paying money there, then they have less resources available for that exclusion overrides for new facilities like the deep cell BWS that's for the deep for any upgrades to schools. And so I'm wondering, is there the bigger, bigger picture in that we not only have this pressure that we need revenue in the city, but we also have the infrastructure that we need. There's no doubt about it, and I know uh, that the council's putting together a task force to look at the storm water uh, management issue, which is again the, the, um, the storm water management, the, the, the levees, trying to figure out there's a we've got a very scary two volume report uh camp dresser McGee which shows you know two hundred million dollars of projects over the next twenty years that we need to accomplish. Some of it because it's required by regulations, others because we just have an aging system and especially with the storm events we've been having, we've seen that system seriously taxed. So uh, that's they're gonna be having a conversation on that committee uh, looking at um, how you pay for those things over time, and you know, like we have, uh, inter we have you know, user fees for water, we have user fees for sewer, for solid waste. One of the things they'll be looking at, which is also recommended, and which other communities have adopted, is a user fee for storm Again, to create a funding stream to be able to pay for those infrastructure needs, but those points well taken. Again, it's still you can call it something else. You can call it a fee, uh, uh, and uh, but it's still going to add to the burden on residents in terms of what they have to pay. Um, so the point's well taken. And, we, and again, we have to look at that in, in, in a fuller context when we talk about uh, overrides and things like that. Uh, people this year have $14.26, or 25 cents of that is for the police station, uh, which again, much needed facility, uh, community was very supportive of it, um, but it does sort of show stresses that are being put on taxpayers. Well, I will point out, you know, again, looking at the slide in terms of where we fall in terms of our tax burden, we are, I think we do have a relatively low tax rate relative to other communities. So, you know, I'm, we often look at our neighbors across the river and marvel at how are they able to do the things they're able to do and, and then you know, look at their tax rate. Uh, they've done three overrides uh, in, in the last several years. So 
Councilor Tate. I think to Mr. Moore's uh, point, we also have overlay surplus or overlay accounts that don't show up in free cash and for reserves. 